Okay, uh, greetings. So, welcome to this lecture. So, uh, let us quickly recap where we stop. We are looking at the parking brake in a typical hydraulic brake with a drum brake on the rear, right? In a passenger car, uh, we uh, learned that the parking brake is by and large achieved through mechanical means, wherein when the driver uh, pulls the hand lever, the parking ca brake cable is pulled and that essentially rotates this lever arm and the parking brake strut presses the brake shoe against the drum. That is how the parking brake functionality is realized. Okay. So, today's class uh, we will get started with uh, figuring out how this parking brake works in an air brake system. So, this was in the previous class we looked at the mechanical uh, parking brake which is uh, typically integrated in the drum brake in a hydraulic brake. So, today let us look at the air brake system uh, which are used in heavy vehicles and uh, see how the parking brake functionality is achieved. So, what happens is that like in the air brake uh, particularly in the rear axles right. So, of let us say a truck or a bus we have what is called as a spring brake chamber. So, if you recall uh, the uh, very simple schematic that we uh, drew for the uh, air brake, I am just uh, going up. So, if you look at this, you know, like there was something called as a spring brake chamber, right. So, if you look at this label, uh, typically mounted in the uh, uh, rear wheels, right. So, and we can immediately see that the spring brake chambers uh, appear to be larger in size than these uh, how to say uh, service brake chambers mounted on the front wheel at least look to be wider or thicker depending on our perspective right. So, that is what is also used to achieve this parking brake and emergency brake functionality in air brakes ok. So, that is what we are going to discuss uh, today. So, the spring brake chamber which is typically mounted on the rear wheels essentially consists of two chambers one is a service brake chamber and a parking brake chamber. So, these are the through two chambers uh, in the spring brake chamber right. So, you can see that there is a, what is labeled as a service brake compartment and a, a parking brake compartment. So, what are what is this parking brake compartment? So, when the vehicle is in under operation right, what, what, what happens is in the parking brake chamber is that there is a highly stiff spring ok, a spring that has a, a pretty high uh, uh, spring stiffness which is held in a compressed state by the air which comes from the reservoir. So, let us say air at let us say around 9 to 10 bars right enters this chamber, it pushes this diaphragm or piston against the spring and holds the spring in a compressed state right. Now, we do the normal uh, braking operation when the uh, treadle wall is pressed, air goes from the primary circuit of the treadle wall to the relay wall and into the service brake chamber and the diaphragm is uh, pushed right the push rod strokes out it rotates the slack adjuster and then the S cam and the brakes are applied right that is normal operation. Now, <coughs> what happens in the event that the uh, driver wants to apply the parking brake or in the event that there is an emergency scenario right. So, this schematic essentially corresponds to normal brake operation ok. So, here uh, service brake is engaged while the parking brake is not. So, that is the normal uh, operation right. So, of the service brake chamber. So, 
as we just discussed you know like this spring is held in a highly compressed state by this compressed air and then the air enters from the relay wall and then pushes the push rod out okay. So, that is the service brakes uh, operation. What happens in the event of engaging the parking brake? So, when the parking brake is engaged the driver actuates a parking brake wall and what it does is that it exhausts the compressed air to the atmosphere right. So, then what happens the force which was previously holding the spring the high tension spring in a compressed state is now released because compressed air is exhausted. So, what will happen the spring would expand right and then it pushes this mechanism against the service brake diaphragm and the push rod is pushed out the slack adjuster rotates the S cam rotates and the brake shows contact the brake drum. So, this is how the parking brake is engaged in an air brake chamber right that is why it is called as a spring brake chamber right. So, air is exhausted and the restoring force of the spring is used to engage the parking brake ok. This also serves as an emergency brake why because let us say you know like we are uh, driving our truck or the bus on a highway and let us say one of the main air lanes break break away right breaks off right and just creating a scenario like that right. So, what happens there is no air supply to the treadle wall or the relay wall and <coughs> so if the main air line breaks off even there would not be any air supply to the spring brake chamber is it not then the spring will automatically be released and the brakes will be applied ok. So, that ensures that this also acts as a as an emergency brake. If you have a tractor trailer system or a tractor a semi trailer uh, vehicle right even if the uh, semi trailer or the trailer breaks away from the tractor right the air lines are also disconnected. So, the pressure would be lost in the spring brake chamber and the spring brake will get engaged and the semi trailer or the trailer will stop because of this braking action ok. So, that is that is one more way it acts as an emergency brake in a tractor trailer uh, or a tractor semi trailer combination right in multi, uh, multi unit articulated vehicles ok. So, that is how the parking brake is uh, engaged right. Of course, if you want to disengage a parking brake obviously, they when the driver let us say starts a parked bus or a truck they need to charge up the storage reservoir to a sufficiently high pressure and then pump pressurized air into the spring brake chamber. So, that the spring is pushed back and then the parking brake is disengaged ok. So, that is how it works. So, that uh, completes the discussion on hydraulic and air brakes. So, the next important topic which I am going to discuss in this lecture is on what is called as an anti lock brake system or an ABS right in short. So, what is this uh, anti lock brake system as the name suggests or the term suggests right. So, this is a system that is supposed to prevent lock of a wheel that is why it is called anti lock right. So, it is major expectation is to prevent lock up of wheels during braking. We will see why this should be prevented and what are the consequences shortly right and what is this wheel lock right lock up of wheels or wheel lock. So, a wheel is said to be locked <coughs> or 
wheel lock is a process where when in this case right the wheel stops rotating but the vehicle is still in motion. Okay, that is when a wheel is said to be locked. See what we commonly call a skidding, you know, the vehicle skids, right. So, this is a proper definition of uh, wheel lock, right. So, why is this uh, uh, important, you know, and why it should be avoided, right. So, let us look at a broad set of reasons and discuss the signs behind this, right. So, for that purpose, let me uh, introduce a simple schematic of a particular let us say tyre uh, assembly, wheel assembly. Let us say that uh, this is the direction of vehicle's motion. So, that is the longitudinal direction as far as the vehicle motion is concerned and the wheel is rotating counterclockwise okay, in, as far as this visualization is concerned. Now, when we brake, drum brake or disc brake, right so we are going to develop a clockwise brake torque so that's what this thick arrow indicates in this figure right so that is the uh, clockwise uh, brake torque and that is going to generate a brake force at the wheel right and at the tire road interface on uh, uh, on the wheel assembly and there is a normal force or normal load acting on the tire road assembly sorry tire road interface right at the tire road interface on the wheel assembly correct. So, these are the various aspects. Now, if we look at a pneumatic tire it does not undergo pure rolling motion. So, what happens is that this pneumatic tire is such that when it enters what we call as the tire road contact patch or contact area okay. Initially the tire sticks to the surface then it starts slipping. So, essentially there is a sticking process and a slipping process. So, it does not undergo a pure rolling motion. See for example, uh, in many physics problems right high school physics problems you would have consider a rigid cylinder you know like undergoing pure rolling motion on a surface and so on right. In this particular case you know like the pneumatic tyres which are used in road vehicles they slip okay when they are subjected to motion does not matter whether they are being driven or being braked okay either way. So, then what happens is that there is something called as the wheel slip ratio. or what is also called as longitudinal wheel slip which is uh, denoted by the symbol lambda which is nothing but v minus r omega divided by v where this v is the vehicles longitudinal speed it is a speed at which the vehicle is travelling along the longitudinal direction. Omega is the angular speed of the rotating wheel and R is the effective tyre rolling radius. So, if the if the tyre or the wheel assembly uh, is undergoing pure rolling motion, what will happen? This V will be equal to R omega, right? But it is not, right? So, V is the longitudinal speed of the vehicle, R omega is the circumferential speed of the wheel along the longitudinal direction due to its rotation. There is a difference between the two, okay? 
this wheel slip ratio or longitudinal wheel slip quantifies the difference. So, V minus R omega is a difference and it is normalized by the parameter or the variable V and obviously this is going to vary as the vehicle operates. So, if we plot an axis of lambda and mark the extreme values. See typically you know like this is how the definition of lambda is taken during braking okay. Uh, during uh, traction you know it is taken a little bit differently you know uh, but we will we are considering braking. So, we will consider this particular definition but the concept is the same that is the at the tire road interface the tire slips and this slip ratio is indicator of how much it is slipping okay. So, that is what we are interested in right. So, <coughs> sorry. So, if you look at the value of 0, when do you think uh, the wheel slip ratio will be 0? It is essentially having pure rolling right. So, we have a rolling wheel right V equals r omega. When do you think it will be 1? Of course, for non-zero speeds right yeah. So, at when omega becomes 0. So, the value of lambda becomes 1 for a locked wheel right. So, when the wheel is purely rolling lambda is 0 when it is fully locked the value of lambda is 1 okay. So, the the range of the lambda or the wheel slip ratio is between 0 to 1 okay during braking right. Is this important we are going to see why this becomes very critical. Now, in real life do we know lambda at each and every instant of time? No, because even let us say we measure the wheel speed using wheel speed sensors which are now available in most vehicles equipped with an anti-lock brake systems and even if we know r we do not know v the vehicle longitudinal speed is not known to us to the level of fidelity required for ABS applications right that poses interesting challenges which we will list on right when we uh, uh, discuss the overall uh, system all right. So, just a few more uh, definitions and notations before we uh, look at the physics even further. So, let f is a represent the uh, normal force or what people call as load on the tire okay this particular tire assembly that we are considering. Then the longitudinal force available okay at the tire road interface you know for a particular tire and a particular road condition let us say is given by <coughs> f is an equal sorry f x f x is the longitudinal force right. So, this is denoted as f x okay f x is the longitudinal force this is denoted as some mu x it is going to depend on many uh, other uh, parameters times f is a okay. So, this is going to depend on the wheel slip ratio then it will also depend on what is called slip angle it will also depend on wheel camber angle and so on okay. It may also depend on other factors okay it is a it is a complex quantity right but for the sake of simplicity we are going to do a first cut analysis okay so that is what we are going to do right. So, let me explain what this mu x is but this alpha is what is called as the tire slip angle okay uh, this uh, gamma is what is called as a camber angle. So, when we come to uh, steering uh, we will look at all these uh, quantities right. So, 
but please remember this right. So, this essentially gives me this mu x to be equal to f x by f z. This is how this quantity is defined. This quantity is what is called as the longitudinal friction or traction or adhesion coefficient ok. So, what this mu x typically in longitudinal dynamics literature they would not put the subscript x ok, they will just say hey look this is mu right uh, and they will talk about variation with respect to lambda that means that we are only considering pure longitudinal motion that means we are looking at either uh, braking or driving right what we call as traction right. So, <coughs> the subscript as x does not come, but this is what is called as longitudinal friction coefficient or traction coefficient or adhesion coefficient right ok. Similarly, the lateral force available at the tire road interface is given by f y equals mu y once again it depends on lambda alpha gamma times f z where this mu y which is a function of the wheel slip ratio or the longitudinal slip, uh, the slip angle and the camber angle is essentially the ratio of f y and f z ok. So, this is what is called as a lateral friction or traction adhesion coefficient ok. So, this is mu y. Okay. So, these are some definitions. Now, how do we take them forward? So, you can see that depending on whether I am uh, uh, if I look at a particular tire road interface there is a component of the force along the longitudinal direction and a component of the force along the lateral direction ok and there are limits to how much the tire can support at a particular interface with the road and why is this becoming important going to become important in our discussion let me take a simple example from our uh, daily life. Suppose let us say that I am walking right on a surface right let us say on a road and let us say I am talking to somebody and I am walking I am not looking at the road per se right. So, I know that it is dry by and large. So, what does my brain command you know through my muscles and joints it commands a certain force at the interface between my feet and the road and then we walk right I am walking correct. So, we are we are stable in that sense because somehow we have figured out what is the capacity that can be supported at the particular interface between my feet and the ground and we are able to remain within that capacity is it not. So, then everything is fine. Now, let us say I am talking to you you are walking on my side, but in front of me in my path there is a puddle of water but I have not seen that. So, if I place my feet on the puddle of water without being aware that there is one what would happen to me? I am placing my feet with the same effort right my brain is commanding the same effort or force through my joints and muscles right to the interface between the feet and the road. So, that is like an actuator which is happening. But 
the capacity now at the feet and the road is reduced right because due to the water which is present. So what is going to happen? I will slip correct same thing happens here also okay. So let us say we are driving a car and we are braking our brake system is designed we are going to learn about that is going to be designed for the best operating conditions obviously right because that is that is how that is what we encounter by and large or let me put it the other way it is going to be designed by and large for the operating conditions that we would most commonly encounter which are going to be dry roads right. So now I have an emergency I press my brake pedal completely. So what is going to happen? Let us say I take a round number of 100 Newtons when I slam my brake pedal completely I am expecting my brake to deliver 100 Newtons and it has been designed such that the force at the capacity of the tire road interface is also 100 Newtons right then everything is fine. However, let us say it rains and I have a wet road and I am driving the same car same driver right same speed and same emergency I slam the brake what happens now? The brake system is still designed to deliver that 100 Newtons either through the disc brake or the drum brake but the capacity of the tire road interface now has dropped or in other words the value of this fx or this mu x has now dropped then we have a problem because the tire road interface cannot sustain what the brake system is asking or the driver is demanding through the brake pedal then we have issues okay then the wheel will tend towards locking because the wheel will start slipping more and it will lock. See let us do a simple thought experiment let us say even we have a simple two wheeler a motorcycle we put it on the main stand so that the driven rear wheels is uh, rear wheel is is suspended in air. Now you give a bit of throttle that rear wheel is going to spin right it is going to rotate pretty fast. Now even if you touch the rear wheel brake a little bit it immediately stops how come right because there is no load on the rear wheel right. So of course it is suspended in air right so there is no normal load and no this mu times f is it right. So the brake torque that you are applying is exceeding this limit. But on the actual during the actual braking process when you are driving there is a load on the particular tyre and that creates a traction at the tyre road interface and the braking system tries to remain within the tractive limit or matches the tractive limit under emergency conditions then everything will be stable otherwise you know like we are going to have issues.